right, I think we can go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everybody to the panel discussion today, the events of May 1945 and why they matter today. I see a lot of our donors and members in the audience would like to welcome all of you and thank you for your support. Because of you, um, we're able to provide programs such as these. With the foundation, I am the executive director, Jen Carlson, for those of you who don't know me. Um, established in 1992, our sole purpose as a 501c3 is in raising funds for the museum to support projects such as conservation, acquisitions, and new exhibits. Each year, typically we raise over $150,000 in direct support of these initiatives. And obviously our mission is to help the museum continue to be able to tell our veteran stories, which are so important. For those of you who are able that haven't donated to this initiative, you can donate at wisvetsmuseum.com. It's under the Join Now tab. And now I would like to introduce our speakers for today. We have the new director of the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, Chris Kolakowski, and our curator of history, Kevin Hampton. I'll turn it over to you two. Thank you very much, Jen, and welcome everyone. As Jen said, my name is Kevin Hampton, the Curator of History at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, and I'm joined today with uh, Chris Kolakowski, our new director. Uh, really, this uh, session today isn't going to be as much a formal lecture as it's going to be more of a conversation, kind of a curator's conversation, if you will. It's something that uh, Chris and I have been doing since he started in January. We'll pop into his office every once in a while and throw out a, uh, a historical philosophical question and We'll kind of go from there and one of the uh really it ranges the entire gambit if you think about it uh it goes essentially you know what's the longest war the united states has been a part of and, uh, and we talk back and forth uh and to everything down to the minutia of was gainesville or bronner's farm a separate engagement from a uh, second bull run or manassas or was it rather just a large three-day battle um so we kind of we kind of span the spectrum if you will of different conversation points and one thing that came up early on uh, since he started here on uh, January 6th was VE Day and VJ Day and what can we do to talk about it what should be uh, we be talking about it? not just as a museum but as a community and as a, as a nation and as a global community um, we talk a lot about historical relevancy of course and, and how to keep uh, history relevant to today and bring it forward to today and there's nothing more relevant in all honesty than 1945, um, especially in the 20th century. It's one of the most pivotal years uh, in, in the entire 20th century. And of course, you know, more, most recently conversations have, have shifted to relevancy of, you know, the 1918, 1919 flu epidemic and uh, things like that. But uh, it's really important to make sure uh, that we reflect back on May 1945, especially now. Uh, we had, we were gonna have a window display uh, and we still will uh, when we can, and we hope you'll come out to see it. I'll, I'll uh, show you a little preview of it here at the end, uh, if we have enough time uh, to talk about that relevancy and, and why people should stop and take a moment and, and not only celebrate uh, the end of a war, but actually look at what it means uh, and, and how that war came about or the end of that war came about. Uh, so uh, to start off right out of the shoot, I'll, I'll kick it over to Chris. If you could tell us a little bit about uh, May 1945, and, and what does the war look like 75 years ago today? Well, thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, it's, great to, it's great to see everybody on, on lunchtime. <laughs> As Kevin adds a little bit of uh, spice or a little bit of local, local flavor to our appearance. Uh, 1945, to your point, Kevin, um, <clears throat> in, uh, let me start with this. August 1944, August 3rd, 1944, the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff prepared a report for the Secretary of State, and they looked forward to the end of the war in 1945, because the, the end of World War II was not that far away. And one of the things that they said is it's going to create a change in the world unlike anything we've ever seen since the fall of Rome in 476 AD. They predicted a reordering of the world. They predicted that the traditional colonial powers would go away. Uh, Britain and France, the Netherlands would lose their empires. Even the United States would lose some of its overseas empire, particularly the Philippines. Um, then they predicted that no matter what happened at the end of the war, uh, the European balance of power would have shifted and basically the two superpowers would be the United States and the Soviet Union, which is in fact what happened. And 
in many ways, modern, the modern world, and we can get into this in the discussion, the modern world, um, 1945 is yesterday. Much of the past 75 years of our history can be tied in some way, shape, or form to World War II and its aftermath. Um, and so to me, 1945 is one of the decisive years in the last millennia, um, certainly. And certainly within the lifetime of, of everybody on this, uh, you know, everybody in the last two or three generations. And it deserves our attention. And the world shifted in a very profound way that we're still understanding today and we're still grappling with. And of that year, several months stick out. And one of them is May 1945. This is a very critical month of the year. And uh, let me just, if, you, if I will, I'll just do a quick survey or I go around the world, start in Europe and work our way east. Yeah. Um, first of all, it's the end of the war in Europe and then the end of the war also in the Mediterranean when Germany surrenders on May 7th, 1945. They, well, they signed the surrender on May 7th, 1945. Huh? <laughs> it takes effect at 11.01 p.m. Central Europe time on May 8th. That's why the West celebrates it as VE Day as May 8th. But yeah. if you ask the Russians who were one hour ahead, mm -hmm. it's one minute past midnight on May 9th. And so that's why the Russians have always celebrated Victory Day, as they call it, on May 9th is because of that. And that's, that's an interesting, you know, when you start to think about it, that's kind of interesting in terms of national perception, things like that. Um, of course, that's the last of a great string of surrenders. You have the Italian campaign that ends in, uh, in, on May 2nd. You've got piecemeal surrenders of German forces, May 4th, 5th, and 6th. And then finally, of course, the big surrender on May 7th. Um, and then at that point, you know, Europe... Six years of war comes to a close since September 1, 1939. Europe is a very disordered place. Borders start to move. Populations have been displaced. You've got armies that need to be moved and redeployed and, and everything like that that we can get into later. But just saying Europe is now begin transitioning from war, full-scale war, into peace. Um, as we work our way east, um, you in Burma and Southeast Asia, the consummation of what may very well be the last great victory of the British Empire, I certainly would argue that it is, I is would. Sir William Slim's Burma campaign. He's raced down Burma and uh, between an air, sea, and ground assault will liberate the city of Rangoon on May, May 3rd. And will uh, essentially, although there'll still be some fighting left to do throughout the May, June, and August, Ju May, June, July, and August, Will essentially end the Burma campaign and the British will lift their their uh, eyes from con reconquering Burma, which they'd had that objective for the last couple of years, and look towards Singapore and Southeast Asia as their next objective. Um, in the Pacific itself, liberation of the Philippines continues apace. I actually had relatives in the AmeriCal Division at this point were fighting in the central Philippines to liberate with the help of the Philippine population and the Philippine guerrillas. Um, continue, big battles continue on the main island of Luzon, north and east of Manila. Um, and so those are, are going on in full swing as General Douglas MacArthur continues to fulfill his promise, I shall return to liberate the Philippine people um, before the end of the war. In fact, as a side note, and we can get into this later, the reason that the United States, the United States is alone among the colonial powers to get back and liberate their colonies before the end of the war. That fact, the fact we kept our promise goes a long way toward explaining US, the U.S. position in Asia today. And then, of course, the largest, the largest air, sea, land battle in the uh, history of the world, um, bloodiest battle in the Pacific War, is in its second month at this point. The Battle of Okinawa is the U.S. 10th Army under Simon Bolivar Buckner, Jr., is working its way down, um, trying to conquer this island, which is the heart of the Ryukyu ch chain, great amphibious, uh, great base for future operations against Japan. Is actually, by the way, a prefecture of Japan. Yeah. And is represented in the Japanese legislature um, and is fighting a battle that is basically a full dress rehearsal. Both sides recognize this was a full dress rehearsal for the invasion of Japan, the Japanese home islands. And May really is the climactic and decisive month. Japanese open with a counterattack, and then Buckner launches a main offensive, um, a main drive starting May 11th, um, consummates in several bloody battles, including one today, 75 years ago, when the Marines finally take for good Sugarloaf Hill, which turns the flank of one of the main Japanese defense lines. And by the end of the month, uh, the Japanese will essentially be defeated, although there'll still be several weeks to go. So May is a real, if you think about a hinge point in the year in terms of where the war is changing, but also where the war is finishing and defining the post-war world. May 1945, there's so much going on. And there's so much to talk about just within this 31 days. Yeah.
And it's interesting, you know, especially when you're looking at that comparison of the reactions of what's happening in Europe to what's happening in the Pacific. Um, you've got this need for celebration, and rightfully so, that this massive chapter of World War II is, is coming to a close, um, not without its costs, though, either, and, and the aftermath thereof. But then the reality is, okay, now we're just shifting. It was just one part of a battlefront of a, an entire global war. Um, and that's, that's kind of what we want to talk about a little bit today. Um, so let's, let's start with Europe a little bit here. You know, VE Day really is the crescendo of an intense, an extremely intense series of spring campaigns across the continent. It's not just, you know, the Western Front allies uh, or just the Russians or even just what's happening in Italy. It's, it's a culmination of all three of those. And it really, you know, obviously culminates with the Battle of Berlin. Um, what, what are you, what's your take on, on the significance? You know, over the course of however many decades now, uh, there's been kind of this shifting back and forth of where does the attention and the focus lie? And I would argue you can't, you can't rule out any three of those components in Europe especially because could the Red Army have, have taken on Germany by themselves? Perhaps. I mean, in reality, this is the only war the Russians are fighting at the time. They're not in a, a dual theater conflict yet uh, with Japan since they still have that uh, non-aggression pact with them. They won't join the Pacific War really against Japan until uh, August of 45. Right, August 9th, 1945. Yeah, and so for them, this is their, this is their war. Uh, for, but the reaction of the Western Allies, it's interesting because the first time the lights come on in London and things like that, um, there is that brief relief, but at the same time, within days of the signing of surrender in Italy, they're already starting to ship troops back to the United States to make their way to the Pacific. Um, so, so what's your take on uh, over the course of the last, especially the last, I'd say, three decades? You know, people have said, oh, you can't, uh, you can't essentially rule out one over the other. But you have people saying, no, the real focus is what the Western Allies did, pinning down the Germans. Well, no, the real focus is the Red Army and marching on Berlin. So what do you think? Well, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, May 1945, actually, you bring up great points. And May 1945 is a great way to kind of highlight all of these things. Germany was killed by simultaneous offensives, Nazi Germany, east, west, and from the south. And if you look at how the maps progress uh, from where the, where the Allies are in January of 1945 versus where they are by May 1st of 1945, and certainly, of course, May 8th, 1945, it's a it's it's like a boa constrictor that basically constricts Germany and kills it, yeah, and kills Nazi Germany. And without any of those, you know, you need all three to defeat the Germans. Uh, Churchill said it best. He said that uh, the the what the Red Army did against the Germans from 1941 to 45, which is the largest land war in history, by the way, between the Germans and the Russians, tore the guts out of the German army. That was his exact words: tore the guts out of the German army. And at one point, I think it was 75 or 80 percent of German soldiers fought the Russians in 1943 and 44. I mean, so the Russian, what the Russians do and what the Russians suffer, by the way, should not be discounted. And in many ways, um, is an essential part of Russian identity ever since. One of the one of the things that Joseph Stalin did is he didn't make this a war of communism against fascism so much as he did it about the Russians against the Germans. Yeah. And so that patriotic appeal, I was reading something just this week about some people talking about reinterpreting Stalin. I said, well, if you reinterpret Stalin and you somehow reinterpret the Second World War, you're reinterpreting Russia itself mm -hmm. and the glory of Russia. And so it speaks very deeply to the Russian psyche, which is how he was able to mobilize him as well as he was. So you've got that. Um, yeah, here's a great example. Stalin announces the fall of Berlin, uh, German surrender. Um, you can see all of this. The Russians, for the Russians, this was very, it was two nations, it's been described as two nations that get at each other's throats. Yeah. Uh, that's not to discount what the Western Allies do. Uh, by, by, no, by no means am I doing that. As a matter of fact, the invasion of Normandy, the race across France, has been called some of the most spectacular ground action in the history of the United States Army, and I see no reason to, yeah. no reason to alter that opinion. North Africa, Sicily, Italy, proving ground for some of the leaders that would later lead our armies across, and I include the British and the Allies in this, 
um, march across from Normandy all the way across into central Germany, no question about that. But you're also right, the war has a global dimension. And even in March and April of 1945, when we are getting close to these armies actually meeting, the Red Army and the Allied armies meeting in central Germany, there's already a question, who's gonna take Berlin? Where are they gonna meet? How are we gonna manage this? Washington is telling Dwight Eisenhower, the commander of the armies coming from the West already, don't forget, we still have Japan. Yep. The army that you have, 75% of the United States Army is fighting in Europe and the Mediterranean. That army is needed to go after Japan after this is done. Keep, and there's already a shortage of infantrymen. There's already, there's already some supply issues and replacement issues. And so there's already this question of save manpower in Germany yep. so we can use them against the Japanese. And that's one of the reasons why Eisenhower leaves Berlin to the Russians. He gets an estimate saying there's going to be, you could get to Berlin. Sure, you could beat the Russians to Berlin. Yeah. But you'd lose 100,000 in the process. Yeah. Well, I need those 100,000 for other conflicts. And in the end, it cost the Russians over 300,000 casualties, killed, wounded, and missing, to take Berlin from April 16th to May 2nd, 1945. So do the math. Do the per week or even the per day casualties math of that. Yeah. So never forget, this, this war has a global dimension. And even within Europe, it's got several dimensions to it also. Yeah. And I would say, especially, too, with, with the Russians taking Berlin, not only is it a strategic movement, of course, or a strategic move so that you can allocate resources that are going to be needed in a different theater of war, but it's also a political move in a sense. You know, the, there's realization that there is a need to open up a second front uh, against Japan later on as well. Because up to this point, primarily, it's been the American Navy and the Anglo-American uh, forces moving in through the Pacific from essentially the South and, and East moving West across the Pacific. And yes, you have the China Burma Indy theater, but it's never been one to really take on the Japanese army that's in Manchuria that's still sitting there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another element to this whole discussion. And like I, like I said before, I think there's an element we had to take Berlin. There was no question about it. If, if the Western allies had taken it, I don't think there would have been as much fulfillment. I, it's not the right word, but it, it, it needed to be that ultimate victory for the, U, for the USSR in order to say that they, yes, they had beaten back the Germans from their doorsteps and taken the fight to them. I mean, Marshall... Well, think about the political dimension of that question and how we're already starting to see divisions between that had been papered over during the war between the Soviets and the Western Allies, and even within the Western Allies, over the fate of Europe, over the fate of the end of the war, um, even strategic questions dating back to the Warsaw Uprising of 1944 and supporting the Polish uprising there. Um, what the Russians would do, what they would allow the Allies to do in the process, using air bases, airlifts, things like that. And so this question of Berlin is, again, tied to the prestige of Soviet arms, mm -hmm. you're already starting to see the seeds of the Cold War, which would obviously go for another 45 years after the, the depending on how you score it, either 45 or 46 years after uh, the fall of Berlin in 1945. So you're already seeing some of these cracks in the alliance as well. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you think of popular opinion or popular understanding of history, you know, of World War II history, especially, you know, you essentially go from Pearl Harbor straight to D-Day, uh, then onto the Battle of the Bulge, and then back to Okinawa and the war's over. Um, so there's a lot of nuance there that's that's lost in that general understanding. Um, but it, you, you think about the, the Western theater, or the Western front, if you will, of Europe, there's, by the time you hit May 1945, even the end of April, frankly, there's not really as much a front as there used to be, you know, out of coming out of the Battle of the Bulge, that's when you really have a true line, uh, a main main line, um, where you have elements lined up against equal elements of, of the opposition force. But by April and May, you have pockets of, of resistance. You, you've got pockets that you've surrounded, especially in the Ruhr Valley, um, where you have massive groups of, of uh, Germans surrendering by early May. Um, mm -hmm. The, really the last front, if you will, the last true battle line is 
before Berlin. Um, and that's, that's kind of the, the missed story, I think, in our interpretation. And a lot of that comes out of, like you said, the, the Cold War. Look at the national uh, narratives that come out of immediately after World War II of, of what you should focus on, what you should talk about. But one thing I, w- I want to draw your attention to on, on this page, this, of course, is from May 3rd, um, right after uh, the, uh, the fall of or the, the surrender of the German troops in Italy. And of course, uh, the surrender of the large uh, force of the large German um, forces to uh, Montgomery, the British. Um, oh yeah, Northwest Germany. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but I, one, I love these old headlines, these old front pages, because they have maps, and I love maps. Anyone who knows me knows I love maps. I'm a very visual person, um, and you can see just here's Berlin, of course, uh, and the Russian front is up to here, whereas the uh, United States forces and then, of course, the British army groups are kind of encircling those pockets that, that they're able to break through to and, and move around. Um, but one thing I want to point out, just because it's interesting, is this little article down here. Cities VE Day plans altered to fit requests for restraint. And that's kind of an interesting point because, you know, 20, what, 24, 20, however many years ago. This is the Madison paper, right? And yep. Okay. This, you know, so 20 some years ago before in 1918, right in the height of the flu <laughs> epidemic, everyone's out on the streets celebrating the end of this war. And, and they rightfully should. It's the end of the Great War. Um, but 20 some years later, there's a little concern that people are going to be out and, and celebrating, not because there's a flu pandemic going on, but because the war is really not over. So the mayor has actually laid out plans of how to restrain the celebration because the war is not done yet. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great that we can talk about uh, and, we should, and we should commemorate and remember those that were lost in Europe. But realistically, most of those troops might be transferred to the Pacific. So they tempered the reaction in Madison for VE Day. Uh, in fact, the bars and taverns did not open. Uh, they stayed closed. Uh, unlike uh, 20 some years before. And so talking about what that reaction is like is where I'm hoping we can go next. Sure. But, and you and I both have relatives that were in Europe that were on the troop schedule for one of the in- ske- slated invasions of Japan, either the Kyushu in late 1945 or in, uh, you know, in Honshu in the spring of 1946. Right. So there are a lot of people, and if any of you have seen the movie the Band of, or the, the miniseries Band of Brothers, they get into this very well about the point system. Some of you have done enough, you can go home and yep. get your discharge. But there are a lot of people that don't have enough threshold of service points, and they're on the schedule to go to the Pacific, potential. Yep. And that, oh, I mean, that yeah, there, there's a sobering realization that this is by no means over. Yeah. And the reality that the seventh war loan uh, drive had just started at the beginning of May um, is also on the, uh, in the minds of people that are back here on the home front, especially because there's a concern that, well, if the war has ended in Europe, are we going to get enough support? We, we still need that financial support to finish the war in Japan. Um, and here, of course, I have the, the poster from that, which is the famous image only, you know, of the photograph taken only a couple months before on Iwo Jima, right? Um, but it, it, you know, it's it's one of those things that even rationing uh, isn't going to go away anytime soon. Yeah, the lights may be able to come back on. I know that the governor ordered the lights on the Capitol Dome here in Madison lit for VE Day um, for the first time in years. Um, but it's the real the reality that the war is still happening is is definitely there. Absolutely. Well, and that's actually a good segue to, to look at the war in the Pacific at this point, because what's happening with the war in the Pacific, and this is something a lot of people don't realize, is in 1945, Germany suffered the its single deadliest year of the war, okay? And it wasn't even in, at war six months. The same was true of the Japanese. Yeah. Um, if you look at these battles, um, the liberation of the Philippines, by the time it's all done from basically from January 1945 until August of 1945, 47,000 battle casualties of all causes, not to mention psychological casualties on top of it. That's 100,000 U.S. We kill, outright kill, or, or otherwise eliminate over a quarter million Japanese in the Philippine Islands. The 100,000 Japanese on Okinawa are in the process in May of 1945 of, of basically almost all getting killed. 
uh, plus the Okinawan militia, it's about 120,000 Japanese defenders. And along the way, we're encountering Philip, uh, Okinawan civilians. This is one of the few islands that we've really invaded as we're going across the Pacific that has had large numbers of Japanese civilians. One of the others was Saipan in the summer of 1944. And of course, there's the famous or infamous story of the suicides, the Japanese civilians believing the Americans were gonna do horrible things to them and decided to die for the emperor by jumping off the cliffs at the north end of the island. Yep. That is being repeated in Okinawa. You also have Okinawan civilians in, hiding in Japanese caves, either sometimes, a lot of times with their will, sometimes against their will, getting caught up in the battle. And of these islands, 450,000 population, 82,000 of them will die in the course of the fighting. And Okinawa, we will lose about 49,000 killed, wounded, and missing. And if you add in the psychological casualties, because you've got a lot of veterans that have fought all the way across the Pacific to Okinawa, it's about 75,000 U.S. casualties. So the fighting is getting worse, and everybody's already thinking ahead. One of the reasons to invade Okinawa, you can see where it is right there, kind of in the north central part of the map. It's a great air base, along with Iwo Jima, and along with Saipan, Tinian, and Guam, for bombardment against the Japanese home islands by bombers and fighters and things like that. Mm -hmm. But it's also a great base to stage invasion shipping for an eventual invasion of the Japanese home islands. And again, everybody's looking at Okinawa, a prefecture of Japan. This is a full dress rehearsal for what's, what is probably going to have to happen on the home islands. And to your point about the Japanese army, the Japanese army has 5 million men under arms, 2 million of whom are in the home islands. So there is no sign. In fact, in many ways, the fighting is getting worse. The yeah. Japanese defensive tactics have gotten more stringent. They've become much better at de building defenses. Um, the, the, if you ask the staff of the 10th Army on Okinawa at this point, they say that they are facing the toughest fighting they've had to face the entire Pacific War. And it, it, is, it is savage, close quarters combat, and there's no sign that it's going to get any smoother or any easier. Unlike in, unlike in Europe, where once you cross the Rhine, essentially the German front has been broken from the, from the Western Allies' perspective. Right. Out here, that is not the Pacific perspective at all. As a matter of fact, if anything, it's getting tougher the closer you get to the home islands. Right. And I think taking into account those casualties, one, it's, it's very topical right now because we've got Memorial Day coming up you know, a week from today. And it's something to remember that cost of life. You know, you look at European theater where from June until June of 1944, from D-Day essentially till May of 1945, there were 552,000 uh, casualties in Europe. And of those, 104,000 were killed uh, in action. And so that cost of life is, is still very clear on the minds um, of those planners, especially in Washington, but also effective here at home. Um, those that are still waiting for word from people, you know, as you go across Europe and moving then, as you move into uh, the Pacific, you're starting to see people liberated from prisoner war camps and other places too, where or maybe not found. And those, those numbers and that human element is still uh, very, very evident that the war is still happening. Now you've got, to that point, you've got Wisconsin National Guard personnel, uh, male and female, by the way, who had been captured in the defense of the Philippines in 1942. Some had been liberated by this point. The movie, The Great Raid, talks about that, the liberation of Cabana Tawan. Others yeah. have been executed, others have died as prisoners, others are awaiting liberation because they're still on the home islands or they've been transported uh, somewhere else. On the other side of the coin, you're absolutely right. Um, if you haven't, for, for anybody in the audience that hasn't seen uh, or hasn't reviewed the book, uh, Third Down and a War to Go, yeah. it's about the 1942 Wisconsin Badgers football team. Um, there are several of them that actually get killed on Okinawa in May and June of 1945, yeah. um, serving with the, with the Marines, the 6th Marine Division in particular. Um, so Wisconsin, you know, just because we were talking about these big historical events, Kevin, you know, you and I have discussed this. Wisconsin was there, and yep. Wisconsin service members are all over this. As a matter of fact, Wisconsin-born Admiral Mark Misher commanding the fleet, protecting the invasion forces off Okinawa, this week, twice, almost gets killed by Japanese kamikazes. And he, he was a beat grown, gone bald over his career. And he says, if they keep this up, I may actually grow hair back on my head. <laughs> so Wisconsin is, don't think that this is happening. These are happening in isolation. 
you're absolutely right. Wisconsinites are there, and there are Wisconsinites. There's a USS Bunker Hill, his flagship, on fire. It had to rescue him from that fire as it struck the island of the carrier. Uh, but Wisconsin is here, and Wisconsin is doing its full duty. Wisconsin veterans, men and women, are doing their full duty in all services yeah. um, in these events. One of the one of the images that I want to share, um, and I'm going to see if I can figure it out here, is one of the best ways for me to, to grasp uh, the human element of what VE Day meant, not only in Europe, but also here in Madison and then, of course, or in Wisconsin, and then, of course, uh, over in the Pacific. And it starts with this image here. This is from the Historical Society's collection, our partners over there. And I love this image because it's, it's a, obviously a group of people gathered around the radio listening uh, to that announcement. And you can see in the background, I don't know if you can see my cursor there, may uh, uh on the calendar yeah um and but look at also just look at the the slight you know hunch to the shoulders and things like that because the next image i'm going to show you i think you can see all the smiles look at the smiles on their faces they're all yep they're, if, they're, they're happy to hear this news exactly exactly and now then we take it to the next one uh the next image we're going to look at here and it's the same message essentially Almost the same day, probably the same, almost the same time. Yeah, with the, actually with the time difference, it's probably pretty close. And look at the, again, the hunch of the shoulder. And just poetically looking at that dichotomy of the two images, um, but obviously no, not smiling because these soldiers are the ones that are still fighting. These are the ones on Okinawa. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you a little bit about these guys because a lot of people may see this image and not really know much about it. First of all, you notice it's raining. It rained for 17 straight days on that battlefield. And by the end of May, the mud was so thick yep. um, and so deep that jeeps were sinking down into their holes and you had to supply troops by air because you can't get the trucks, you can't get anything up to them. The mud was, was severe. Uh, but the other thing is you'll notice the, the square painting on the guy's side of the guy's helmet there. That tells me that they're 77th Division. They had done that on their helmets for Esprit de Corps and things like that. Um, these guys are facing the heart of the Japanese defense line around Shuri Castle. And while you've got the Marines attacking Sugarloaf Hill on one end, and you've got the 96th Division attacking Conical Hill on the other end and trying to flank the Japanese lines, if you will, think about, think about it in a football analogy where you've got the defensive ends trying to get around, get around and get to the quarterback. These guys are the nose guards of the defensive tackles going head on into the teeth of the Japanese defenses. Yeah. So you can see on their faces, it's, well, this is great, yeah. but in 48 hours, I've got to go for this part of this grand offensive that we're about to launch. I've got to go into the teeth of the Japanese defenses right? Um, you know, in, in front of the Okinawan capital, or right. the old Okinawan capital, I should say. Um, well, so what does it mean to me? And you see it in their facial expressions. Exactly. And it's not like you know, you're going to be relieved by divisions coming from Europe even within a couple of weeks. You know you're going to be there until – at least for a couple months before you're going to get a full division to really deploy to the Pacific anyway. Yep. Absolutely. Right. So one thing I do want to make sure we talk about, um, is why it still matters. Um, obviously Europe, uh, uh, we've talked about the end of the war and the events surrounding that. And we've talked a little bit about uh, what's actually happening in the Pacific and how the war is still going on. Um, but the, the, so what the, what does that mean for the next 50 years, especially at least within Europe, if we're talking about that event particularly? Well, in Europe, if you want to know where the modern map of Europe is drawn, it was drawn in 1945. And specifically, it was drawn even before the end of the war at the Yalta Conference, where they reordered territory. They gave part of it, part of what was pre-war Poland to the Soviet Union, then the Soviet Union, now Belarus and Ukraine. Um, one of the reasons, by the way, if you look at a map of Russia today and you go and you look, they've got this little enclave on the Baltic called the Kaliningrad Oblast. There's, that's the Yalta meeting right there with uh, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin in the front row. Mm -hmm. uh, that was because Stalin wanted a warm water port on the Baltics. And he took the German city of Königsberg and they made it Kaliningrad. And northern half of East Prussia in Kaliningrad, or Königsberg, is Kaliningrad today. Southern half went to Poland, along with everything of Germany, 25% of pre-war Germany, east of the Oder and Nysa rivers. And um, this is 1939. Hopefully we've got a 1945 map up here. 
Um, but uh, yeah, there you go. You can see how Poland has moved to the west. Yeah. And you can see some of the lines in gray. Um, and how Ber Germany has lost 25, if you compare the previous map to this map, Germany's lost 25% of its territory, um, including some areas that people had emigrated from to this state, including part of my family. Um, Danzig became Gdansk. Um, and basically Berlin, you can see now is 30 miles, instead of being a little bit more in the middle of, mid eastern middle of Germany is now basically 30 miles or 40 miles from the Polish border. Yeah. Um, there's been border moves as well around Czechoslovakia. You can see right there, the, the shaded, the pink shaded area is Germany um, in 1939, along with East Prussia. And you can see right here, Germany in 1945 and after 1945. Yep. Um, it completely alters the geography of Europe. And one of the things actually at the end of the Cold War, one of the deals that the Germans had to cut with the Poles was because remember this whole war started over German claims over Polish territory. The Poles said, we will let you reunify if you confirm that you will renounce all claims to anything east of the Oder and Nysa rivers. Yeah. And that was the condition of German reunification. Yeah. And it was done. And the Germans went ahead and accepted it by that point. Of course, the other big thing, the start of the Cold War, the Russians um, basically through means fair and foul imposed com communist governments, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, Yugoslavia um, is communist, but they become non-aligned. And that's a whole other talk for a whole other time is Tito and Yugoslavia. Um, <laughs> And then Eastern Germany, the Russian part of Germany, the Russian occupation zone of Germany becomes East Germany. And the, con uh, the continent divides by the Iron Curtain and will remain so. As a matter of fact, if you ask the Hungarians, if you ask the Czechs, if you ask the Poles, as I have, a lot of them um, say that they exchanged one occupation for another in 1945. They've mm -hmm. been occupied by the Germans, some of them, in the case of the Poles, since 1939, the Czechs since 38. And then here you have another occupation by the Soviet Union. Um, from 1945 to 89 in some cases, 91 at the latest in other places as well. And then the populations. Exactly. And this map- Population I displacement is just, there are millions of people that have been displaced, either forcibly, been retreating in advance of the armies, things like that. Yep. Um, some of them, we, we had agreed at Yalta, not thinking it through, that we'd repatriate to their home countries, all these displaced people. Well, there are millions of people outside the Soviet Union that don't want to go back. Yep. <laughs> Including Ukrainian patriots, there are many Soviet prisoners of war that because they had allowed themselves to be captured, whatever the circumstance, are therefore considered traitors to the Soviet Union. There are several that were captured at the beginning of the German invasion in 1941 in Brest-Litovsk, survived four years of German prison camps, which are horrific immediately are repatriated, go to the gulag and spend years in the gulag because they've been a traitor to the Soviet Union for allowing yeah. themselves to be captured. There are also Poles like my grandfather, in many ways, the fall of the Iron Curtain is the reason I'm here, is because my grandfather, many of his, like many of his friends, had either escaped to the West immediately in 1939 or had come through the gulag and the Anders army um, in 1941-42 and had evacuated to the West. Some of them had fought in Italy, some of them have fought in the Western campaigns. They're loyal to the government in exile in London, not the communist government that the Soviets have set up in, in Poland. Some of them go back. And my grandfather had friends that went back and he, they were never heard from again. Some of yeah. them have been discovered in mass graves. Some of them disappeared into the Soviet Union. They were never heard from again. My grandfather, Spent three years in the gulag, being captured in 1939 by the Russians. As far as he was concerned, he wasn't going back. And decided, he and, his, he and his English wife decided that the United States was a better, far better option. But that's why you have a Polish diaspora now in places like, a Polish descent diaspora now in places like the United Kingdom, even Australia, even New Zealand, all across the former British Empire. Right. Um, and even in Germany in places as well. And of course, the United States is many of these people couldn't go back home because of the Iron Curtain. In fact, my father never met his grandparents because they were on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain. Wow. So coming back to what you talk about is, you know, we talk about these great historical events, but never forget how they impact people 
you know, people, and many of these people become tied to Wisconsin. As a matter of fact, there's some former Soviet soldiers who were involved in some of the famous meetings of U.S. troops oh. after the war emigrated. A couple of them settled in Milwaukee and were profiled in the Milwaukee Journey's Journal Sentinel a few years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, so when you think about Wisconsin ties to the war and you think about the personal impact of these great historical events, um, you know, that, that's, that stays with you. It's not just the geopolitics. It's not just the politics. It's not just the government. It's the personal and it's the yep. family trees and that's a, that stays with you. And that's an echo too. And that's I'm sorry. I probably about. went a little too, little too deep on that, but with my last name of Kolakowski, but you know, that's, that's a reality that I grew up with and continue to <laughs> continue to believe very strongly in. And that's exactly what, what we do. We talk about that humanity behind the history or the is behind it. that's history relevance it's it's that personal story you know we talked about you talked about your we have both have relatives that were in europe fighting um uh at the end of the war and even decisions that will be coming in 1945 things like to drop the bomb instead of uh invade japan have a profound impact on on families across the united states and especially here absolutely right no, this is this is not dead history by any stretch, and it's still it and its impacts remain with us, remain with us to this very minute. Yep. And with that, I think we'll. Uh, I saw Jennifer's hand go up, so I think we'll move to Q and A. All right. Thank you, Chris and Kevin. Uh, the first question comes from Meg Jones. Japan and Germany were shattered countries at the end of World War II, but with lots of help from America through the Marshall Plan and other initiatives, those countries eventually became thriving democracies. Is that same scenario possible or unlikely in the countries America has recently fought in Iraq and Afghanistan? Ooh. Is this on the record, Meg, or off? <laughs> Chris, I'll let you take that one first. <laughs> um, every situation is different. Yeah. Okay. Every post-war situation is different. You can look at, at post-war situations. Um, I would argue in the nuclear world, the way conflicts end is, is very different from what it was in 1945. I'll simply say, make a couple of points on this about how 1945 influences perspectives. It actually influences the perspective of the question. First of all, one of the um, lessons that has come out of this and has frankly, I think, given a lot of people pause in terms of arms limitation, in terms of the Geneva Conventions of 40, 1949, things like that, is looking at destroyed Germany and Japan and saying, can we really, in the, particularly in the nuclear world, do this? And is this really, can, should, should we really do this to ourselves again, is the question. Right. Um, and so trying to avoid that is part of that is part of what you see in terms of the conduct of war in the future. Um, and some of this is a whole talk for a whole other time. Yeah. I'll simply say this other thing as well is, is Germany and Japan required an investment on the part of the United States that in many ways remains the exemplar today and is the standard upon which everything else afterwards has been judged. Yeah. Um, it's, the, it's MacArthur and the rebuilding of Japan um, and it's the Marshall Plan in Europe. And how many times do you hear, oh, the Marshall Plan, we need a Marshall Plan for this, we need a Marshall Plan for that, or we do that. That's that good. is now the gold standard. Yeah. And that's the prism that everybody views it through. Yeah. And so to my, actually, I turn it back on you, Meg, and think about that and think about, is that really the metric we should have? Is that really where we should be? Um, and in reality, should we be measuring success on a case-by-case -case basis? Uh, Kevin, I don't know where, if you have anything to add. No, I think you hit it right on the head. And, and the fact that it's, it's situational differences. Um, you're looking at Europe, especially a Europe who within only two decades, three at most, essentially destroyed itself twice. Um, World War I decimated uh, Western Europe. Uh, and of course, World War II decimated essentially Central Europe. Uh, if you're looking at the towns and all that were, were completely wiped out. And it, it's something that you have to take into account two generations in a row, uh, especially in, in Europe, that really 
fought one war if you think about it in the in the grand scheme of things the two generations resolved almost the same conflict except after the first part of the war in world war one they tried a, a republic approach and it didn't hold um so there's it's much more than just um throw money at it and fix it all right thank you both we have another question coming in here from neil kundi how many U.S. soldiers were eventually transferred from the European theater to the Pacific in the months that followed VE Day? That is a very good question. Less than 50,000, less than you think. Yeah. There was a lot of, what they had started was they'd started the pipeline to go west and they transferred some headquarters and some service units and things like that. The combat units hadn't really started going yet. Because um, the, the original plan was for the invasion, the main invasion of Japan. Uh, it was going to be a two-stage invasion. The first invasion was going to be uh, November 1st, 1945 was the planning date in southern Japan. That was going to be all forces already in the Pacific. Yeah. The forces that were coming from Europe, which included British Commonwealth forces, by the way. There was a Commonwealth course on the schedule of a British, Australian, and I think an Indian Army division. Were all on the schedule for March of 1946 because they knew it was going to take time to get these troops reorganized, retrained, and get them across and a certain amount of acclimatization. And so it was spring of 1946 was really when most of the European forces that were on the schedule to come over were gonna get, were gonna get there. Of course, the war ended before most troops got a chance to move. Right. Uh, but you did have a few over there. As a matter of fact, the commander of First Army, Courtney Hodges, who was gonna be the senior European officer transferred from Europe to Asia, was in the Philippines in, in August 1945 and witnessed the Japan surrender on the deck of the USS Missouri. Yeah, I think there's, there was even more troops um, stateside still um, making their way to California to, to deploy than, than, you give, than we think about too. I mean, my grandfather had been in Italy and was on the second boat essentially out of Italy uh, as they were transferring them over they landed in New York and were in California in August ready to ship when they got word that it was that, that the uh, war was over and there was no need and they called off the deployment. So it, it's not easy moving an entire uh, multiple armies uh, across the globe. Um, and so the, the process that would, would have taken longer, but it was in the works. They were making their way there. I'll just say this, the United States Army had, I, I used the figure earlier, just to give you an idea of the scale of the problem. The United States Army numbered 8 million, including the U.S. Army Air Forces, 8 million in the Second World War. 75% of it was in Europe or the Mediterranean. Yeah. So I, I, a lot of people in the audience are better at math than I am, and certainly quicker at math than I am, but you can get a sense of the scale of the problem. Yeah. And getting people getting people transferred either home for discharge or to the Pacific for further service. And that all echoes back to 1941 with the decision that Germany first. Yeah, the basic allied strategy of the war. Beat the Germans first, yep. Yep. We have another question from Jocelyn Dawson. After VE Day or even throughout the war in the ETO, how aware were troops in Europe of the events in the Pacific? Did they have a feeling they'd be redeployed right away? Or was there a stronger belief that would be going home, that they would be going home? That's a really good question. Um, our oral histories, actually, we've been delving into them a lot, um, enlighten us a lot to that, uh, especially the mentality of what people were thinking that were in Europe um, and the reality of going home. Of course, as Chris talked about, you have the point system uh, and it's, known at that point it's even published in the wisconsin papers that there will be discharges coming instead of having just a direct transfer over to the pacific um depending on length of service and other qualifications but it's definitely known that there, there's the reality that it, i could be heading back over to the pacific the war's not over for me yet she has a follow-up too to that um what are your thoughts on redeployment thoughts on redeployment like in general or or <laughs> that's just what she asked probably in general i'll simply say this and this might be this is a demands a fuller discussion for a, a another time about the 
end of the war in the Pacific, prospects for the invasion of Japan, things like that. Um, I will simply say this, we did not have enough forces. If we had had to invade Japan, we did not have enough forces to do what we needed to do to take to conquer the home islands with what we are had in the Pacific. And I say we being the allies um, in 1945, in the summer of 1945, we had to use elements of the army in Europe. Japan had two million men under arms in the home islands. They were arming the populace to fight the allies on the land. It, it would have been the, it, it would, I'm very thankful the battle wasn't fought because of the prospective scale of human carnage. But they were looking at Okinawa and they were saying that of the invading force of Okinawa, 35% took some form of casualty. Mm -hmm. You extrapolate that over the size of some of these invasion, projected invasion forces in the Japanese home islands, and you're looking at 100 to a quarter million killed, wounded, and missing. Again, this is a fuller discussion for a fuller time. <clears throat> the troops we had in the Pacific were not enough. We needed that army in Europe to uh, finish, finish off the Japanese. At least that's how that looked in May, June of 1945. And again, the rest of it's a fuller discussion for a fuller time. Yep. Another question we have, how close was Greece to becoming an Eastern satellite of the USSR? How close was Greece? The answer is much closer than a lot of people are willing to admit. Yeah. Um, the British actually detach forces from Italy to invade Greece as the Soviets are sweeping down through Romania and Bulgaria because they want to forestall. And this is in the fall of 1944. They want to forestall Soviet, uh, Soviet influence in the, what Churchill called the cradle of democracy. And actually Churchill and Stalin cut a deal and Churchill says, I, Greece should be in our sphere of influence. If we're going to divide Europe, Greece should be in our sphere of influence. Um, and I'm greatly simplifying just for the sake of this, this answer. Yeah. After the war, the communist revolution and the Greek civil war that breaks out is a huge moment in post-war Europe. Because Britain, having done this, to Kevin's point, has done this twice. And they are, they're exhausted. They had passed their peak of industrial production in 1943. One of the reasons my grandmother didn't want to stay in Britain was because they were on wartime rationing for the foreseeable future, which didn't end until 1955, mm -hmm. by the way. They can't support it. In February 1947, they write to Truman and say, our support to Greece, which we had promised, we can't do it anymore. We can't. It's, we're bankrupt. And so the United States sends a man named James Van Fleet and arms basically stands up there and reinforces the Greek army and supports the Greek army enough for them to remain um, part of the Western world as opposed to falling to the Eastern Bloc. But it was nip and tuck. From that period, 1944 until really 48, during those four years, it was, it was nip and tuck as to whether the Greeks, which, which side, which camp, East or West, the Greeks were going to go. And you look so at... I don't know if you got anything to add. Northern Italy is the same way, especially at the end of the war. One of Mark Clark's biggest issues is that the partisans that are rising up and assisting the Allies, uh, fighting the Germans off in those last few days in Italy, are a, there's a lot of uh, communist groups that are joining them. So he's concerned if he doesn't have allies up there to accept, mm -hmm. allied troops up there to accept the surrender of the German troops, they can't surrender to the, the, the essentially the communist partisans because then they're going to start taking over the regional control of the nor northern Italian uh, provinces. Mm -hmm. So it's it's something the cold war is is almost already happening by the time the war comes to an end i've seen some people say the cold war started in august 1944 and i'm more and more inclined to agree with them when you hear stories like that or the stories of the greeks or the poles yeah i'm more and more inclined to agree with that we have another question from tom we considered the ussr as a superpower in 1945 but they were exhausted by the war was the U.S. and Britain too easy on Russia in letting them keep Eastern Europe? I'm reminded of the movie Patton. <laughs> That's a great question. And I'll tell you I'll, give you, I'll give you three things to consider. Number one, we didn't know it. It's one of those, there's a book that came out by Henry Louis Gates after the fall of the Soviet Union that talked about, it was titled, We Now Know. And one of the things that was in there was we now know just how weak the Russians were, 1945 to 49. Yeah. Stalin, Stalin was paranoid that we, that the Western allies would figure out just how exhausted the Soviet Union was 
because of it took it took just about every ounce of energy that the Russians had to beat back the German invasion of the Soviet Union. So that's the first thing to think about is is Allied intelligence was not not we know more than they did to a certain extent. Second point goes back to what we talked about about the war with Japan, the redeployment, what needs to be done. Um, Franklin Roosevelt had told Stalin at Yalta that within two years we wanted to be out of Europe. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that he's seeing projections that the war against Japan may last into 1947. Yeah. So he's looking very, very hard at that. So the United States Army is not ready, is not poised, is not even thinking about going into Eastern Europe. Third thing is, Stalin said one thing at Yalta. He said free and fair elections at, among, the, uh, among the Eastern Bloc countries. Um, he basically... He basically made a lot of promises that he then broke in Eastern Europe. Free and fair elections, yeah, as long as you disenfranchise all the non-communist parties. Um, we would be, one of the most infamous things that he did uh, was he invited the, it's called the Trial of the Sixteen, and he invited yeah. the local Polish authorities that were loyal to the Polish government in London, invited them all to a conference. Come, let's have a conference. Let's talk about the future of post-war Poland. They all show up, accepting it in good faith. I'll give you safe conduct. He arrests them has flown to Moscow and has all 13 of the 16 convicted in show trials. And so when you put those three factors together, that's how you get the Iron Curtain coming down over Europe. Churchill saw it. Um, but that's, those are three things to think about when we think about um, why didn't the Allies do more or know more and take advantage of opportunities that we now know exist in Eastern Europe. Yep. We have another question from John. Were the Allies planning to ship all of their tanks, jeeps, trucks, artillery used in Europe to the Pacific, or would the troops be re-equipped with new tanks, jeeps, trucks, etc., in the States to, to use in the Pacific? Presumably all planes and ships used in the European theater would travel to the Pacific theater. Short answer is the stuff that I'm seeing, that I've seen, and I haven't delved too, too deeply into this, is by and large, yes, that's what would have happened. Yeah. There were plans to leave some, obviously, uh, as a part of the occupying force, but from what I've read, most of the stuff, or the stuff of the assigned units were going to go with them. And one of the things that we're going to do with that Commonwealth Corps, which is an interesting sign of, of how the British munitions and equipment back uh, system is at this point, they're actually going to re-equip the Commonwealth Corps with U.S. equipment yeah. and train them. So that there was there was plenty of stuff that was going to be going around. The uh, the arsenal of democracy by no means was shut off um, in the summer of 1945. And some of those troops that were staging in the U.S. were being re-equipped um, before being he heading over to Aug uh, in August, um, but they they were definitely bringing back a lot of their own equipment. Okay, and I would like to introduce the marketing director of the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, Jen Stevenson. Jen, did you get any more questions on your end? Hi, everyone. No, I haven't seen any questions. All right. Thank you, Jen. Now, I will be sending a follow-up email with more information on how you can support more programs like these. I would like to also just remind everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. I would like to thank Kevin and Chris for your knowledge and expertise. And of course, for all the supporters that made this program possible. We do appreciate your belief in this important mission and safeguarding our veterans' legacies and helping us share more of these stories with the public. So keep an eye out for the email that I'll send along with the survey. And for any questions that I may have missed that weren't answered, I will make sure that Chris and Kevin can follow up with you via email. Thank you all and have a great day. Thanks, everybody.